it looks like a normal car crash. Tragic, but an accident. But as we all know, looks can be very deceiving. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Deborah Hollerman. Viewer discretion is advised. Real quick before we get started, hello, my name is Mike. If you're into true crime, you should totally subscribe to my YouTube page here. Yeah, I tell three true crime stories every week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And also, I tell short-form true crime stories pretty much every single day over on TikTok. The links to that and my other socials are in the link tree in the description of this video below. But let's get into today's story. Deborah K. Hollerman was born on September 9th, 1960, and she was born in Princeton, Minnesota. And I believe that she was one of four kids. I think she had three brothers. Deborah graduated from high school there in Princeton, Minnesota in 1978. She would then go on to work in the dietary program at the Princeton Hospital. On November 27th, 1988, Deborah would marry the seemingly love of her life, Stephen Hollerman. And then I guess they would live in the Cambridge area. Uh, she was a manager at a local like Taco John's. But then by 1995, Deborah then became the church administrator for the Trinity Lutheran Church there in Princeton. Deborah also had herself her own like little side business called Weekender Casual Wear Clothing. She was very active uh, in the community. She was part of a book club. She was part of an investment club. She was part of a, a gourmet dinner group. On her downtime, she enjoyed quilting. She enjoyed racquetball, tennis, golf. She loved reading and just kind of, uh, you know, lounging next to the lake nearby. Now, from what I understand, Stephen Hollerman had um, a couple of kids before he uh, married Deborah. I believe he had a son and a daughter. Deborah also had two sons, and I think they were from a previous marriage or boyfriend. Deborah and Steven, uh, from the outside looking in, everyone kind of would just say that they had this sort of storybook marriage. It looked like a perfect marriage on the outside. They didn't seem to argue much, at least not in public. I mean, it was just one of those things where it was just perceived as your traditional, normal marriage. But apparently, it wasn't. It was March 22nd, 2002. Deborah, at the time, was 41 years old. A uh, panicked 911 call came in. It was late at night, and the caller said that there was an accident on the side of the road in Asante County in Minnesota. Witnesses said that Stephen, um, by the time they had, these other witnesses had seen the, like, the aftermath of the crash, Stephen was outside of the vehicle with Deborah, um, and he was holding her, cradling in her in his arms. When first responders arrived, Stephen was taken to the hospital, but he pretty much had no injuries, not even a scratch. He was completely unharmed. He said that during this accident that occurred, he was wearing his seatbelt. He stated that Deborah was not wearing her seatbelt and Deborah would be pronounced dead. Now, in terms of the, the car itself, uh, they had this red Jeep and it had a lot of damage to one side specifically of, of the front of the vehicle. And what had happened was it had somehow crashed into another car that was parked on the side of the road. It, it looked like, I guess, a car that perhaps broke down and the owner had to walk away from it. I don't really know exactly whose car it was and or if the owner of her like came tried to come back to the car. I'm not sure, but it was just there on the side of the road. And Steven says he somehow just doesn't really recall how it happened, but he kind of went off the side of the road and he crashed into the back of this thing. He said he was going about 65 miles per hour. 
Now, the back of that vehicle that he hit had pretty bad damage. And then, like I said, the front of their car, the red Jeep, had some damage to one side of the front. But there was no broken glass. No window was shattered. There were some cracks in the windshield, uh, but that was about it. And the reason why I mentioned that is because there was an astronomical amount of blood in this vehicle. I mean, there... One side of this vehicle, especially, was caked in blood. There was blood everywhere. It was on the roof of the vehicle. It was in the back seat. There was, like, spatter um, kind of just throughout the vehicle. There was just, like, pools of blood, like, going down the sides of the passenger side door where Deborah was sitting, all over the front console. The seat was covered in blood. This was just a lot of blood. And one of the officers who arrived said he had never seen that much blood from an accident, especially like this. The accident looked bad uh, because of the damage, but the vehicle itself, the Jeep, was still able to be driven. So it wasn't damaged that badly, so to speak. And the fact that it did not break any windows made them kind of wonder how in the hell, without any shattered glass or like Deborah going through any glass, how was there this much blood? Steve at the hospital, who again was based, and he had like no injuries, he was, he was fine. A lot of people noticed that he wasn't shedding a tear because he had already been told his wife was dead. He didn't seem to be all that emotional, he wasn't crying, but you know, as I've said many times uh, on videos before, Everybody reacts differently to this kind of tragedy. Uh, you can't expect someone to react in this cookie cutter fashion every time. You can't expect everyone to react the way you think you would react because nobody knows how they're going to react until something like this actually happens and hopefully it never happens to you. A lot of very innocent people react coldly. They react with no tears, no emotions, and that's just the way they respond. So, <laughs> The following day, the one of the officers who first responded, uh, he was basically investigating this, and he wanted to take photos of the Jeep um, in the daylight because when this was all discovered, it was, you know, at night. It was kind of hard to see the interior of the car and all that. So he goes to the impound lot, and when the officer goes there, he learns, and this is just two days after the crash occurred, he learns that Steve Hollerman already contacted the impound lot to get the car back, which the officer thought was very strange because the car was still just painted with blood on the inside and it was damaged. And, you know, why did Steve want it back in such a hurry? But anyway, the officer managed to see the vehicle. Uh, he took photos of it in broad daylight and he noticed just more blood, like because he couldn't see all of it at night. So, I mean, he just saw the, the, the unbelievable carnage on the inside of this vehicle. He said to himself, or he thought to himself, there is no way that that blood came from this accident. He just had this gut feeling that Deborah must have already been bleeding when the accident occurred. She was already covered in blood. However, um, other, I guess, uh, accident recreation officers um, and the coroner would disagree with him. The coroner did the autopsy on Deborah, and the coroner notated that Deborah had brain, uh, severe brain injuries, basically like as if her head had moved very fast um, from one, you know, one side to the other. And it caused her brain, I guess, to hit her skull so fast that it caused severe brain damage, but also it caused skull fractures that were extremely consistent with a car accident. So they listed her death as blunt force trauma from this vehicle accident that her head must have smashed into like the console or something and created that those skull fractures. They did notice that on the right side of her head, she had, and they notated this, she had these like, almost like puncture wounds that maybe that's where she hit her head, but it was like on the side. And that wouldn't make sense if the accident was, the momentum took you this way, 
they don't how would her head go that way you know it's it was all very it was just none of it made a lot of sense but they ruled it an accident or they were going to rule it's an accident and the officer notated like if she hit her head that badly to create that much blood how was there no dents there was no dents from her head on the console none it wasn't damaged it wasn't bent in no divots nothing it's just not making sense so one of the investigators was like i want a second opinion on this autopsy because this is not adding up but it was too late deborah um once they ruled her death an accident after the first autopsy she had been cremated there was no hope for doing a second autopsy not feeling completely devastated by this news the officer the investigator decided to question steve Steve said he was giving his play-by-play -play of that night. He said that night he and Deborah had gone out to dinner. Then after that, they went out to go shopping at a couple of stores. So uh, Steve would produce receipts of these purchases. And one thing they noticed was that Steve said they had gone to the store. And after they were done, they went, they were on their way home from the store. But there were no purchases in their vehicle. None. There was no bags. And they did, they, they bought things, but where were those items? So they would go to the stores themselves and they would look for the footage, the CCTV footage of Steve and Deborah. They did find that the very last store that Steve and Deborah had gone to, they found them walking in and then leaving. They left that store sometime shortly after 7.30 p.m. The, the time it would have taken them to get from that store back to their house was about 20 minutes. But the 911 phone call, the report of the car accident, came in around 10 p.m. That meant that there was a two and a half hour window of time where Steve and Deborah are unaccounted for. They also found out that Deborah and Steve, they owned uh, a cabin that they would, you know, frequent. And it was kind of on the way back from this, the store. So the police would go to the cabin. Okay, maybe Steve and Deborah went there. Maybe a fight took place. Steve killed her there, right? So they would probably find signs of some sort of altercation. They didn't find anything like that. There was no blood. There was no, like, you know, hair, you know, caked in blood. There was no sign of a cleanup. There was no smell of bleach. There, they didn't notice, you know, forensically any bleach being used in the house. The, ha the cabin was like a little, you know, cluttered, you know, kind of, but it, it was normal looking. There was no signs of any struggle taking place there. But one thing they did notice was the purchases that Steve and Deborah made at the store. They were in the cabin, which meant that Steve lied because he said they went straight from the store and the intended destination was their house house, not the cabin. So clearly they stopped at the cabin first. But why would Steve lie about that? So while the death was initially ruled an accident, the coroner hadn't signed the death certificate yet as being an accidental death related to a car accident because one of the investigators managed to basically convince them that this needed more a more thorough investigation because something wasn't adding up. So they got a warrant to searched the Jeep, and they found some very strange things. On the driver's seat, there, you know, there's that lever on the uh, left-hand side where you would use to you know, move the seats up and back. And there was blood on that handle. There wasn't really any other blood on that side of the vehicle, the driver's side. They thought it was kind of strange that there was just blood on that particular piece. There was also blood on the, I guess, the switch to turn on the headlights, which again was when in, in an area of the car where there wasn't really any blood. It was the blood, the well, most of the blood was on one side of the vehicle, it seemed. And so they thought it was odd that they found blood on those two just very specific places. The driver's seat was pushed back all the way as far as it could go, which given Steve's heights would have made it very awkward for him to drive. Like it was just too far back for him to have, you know, driven that car uh, in that position. Then 
on Deborah's side of the vehicle, this was back before we had the you know electronic you know ways of adjusting the mirrors on the side of the car. So this was there was like a manual knob, right? And on that knob to adjust the mirror on Deborah's side of the vehicle, that knob was seemed to be the focal point of where the blood originated. There was just a pool of blood surrounding this particular knob, and there was hair. Deborah's hair caked in blood, just like wrapped around this knob. It also had pieces of Deborah's flesh. Then they noticed another interesting thing. The windshield um, had this very unique looking blood stain um, going across on Deborah's side, the passenger side of the vehicle. And the blood stain had a fabric kind of pattern, almost as if an item like clothing, bloody clothing, had hit that the windshield. And when they realized that it was the same size and shape of Deborah's arm, she was wearing a sweater. So what they determined was that when the crash occurred, her arm, which had the sweater, smashed into the windshield and left the blood. But if it was the accidents that created the blood, how was there that much blood already to on the windshield? That didn't make any sense. Especially, how was her sweater just filled with blood to create that state? It, it just wasn't adding up. They determined, again, that Deborah had to have been bleeding profusely already before the crash occurred. So after they thoroughly investigated that Jeep, they determined that the reason why there was blood on the driver's side the, to adjust the seats was that Stephen already had Deborah's blood on his hand uh, and he adjusted the seats and he turned on the headlights and which meant that he had he had to turn on the headlights in order to drive, which means that Deborah was probably already dead or bleeding profusely when he turned on the vehicle. There was blood kind of on the steering wheel as well. And then one more piece of evidence was there was a boot print or shoe print on the window on the passenger side next to where Deborah was sitting. Why? They determined that, that was the exact shoe that Steve was wearing that night while driving that car. They basically, because of all these findings, would reverse this like accidental death ruling and they changed it to a homicide. And so what they believe is that Deborah was already dead when they got into the car. He then had to devise a plan and he just so happened to notice as the, he was driving somewhere with her dying body oh there's a car on the side of the road perfect so he made this plan to crash into that vehicle and when he did that he realized none of the glass broke and he's like well shit how am i going to explain all of this blood if she didn't go through any glass so that's why his boot print was on her window because he was trying to kick it out to create broken glass. He couldn't do it. He couldn't break the glass. And the fact that there were other people who then drove up on the accident meant he had to stop doing whatever he was doing. He had to now make it look like, oh, tragic accident. Oh my God, my wife. Investigators discovered that Steve was being unfaithful. He had a side woman. He was having sex with and in a relationship with another woman and people in Steve's life knew this and Deborah, they believe, knew this. So uh, what they think happened was they had gone to the store that night after going to dinner. Then they must have stopped at the cabin to drop off those items that they had purchased and Deborah likely noticed that there were a couple of wine glasses out because when police went to investigate the cabin, they found a scene that looked like two people had been having a romantic evening there. There was wine glasses there. The bed had been slept in, but not made. And so what they think is that Deborah, when they got to the cabin, noticed, did you bring, did you bring her here? And she probably got pissed off. The fight broke out. And she probably got back into the car and said, take me home. And that's when he reacted by smashing her head 
into the side of the door where her head came into contact with that mirror knob. And he kept smashing her head into it until she was just bleeding everywhere. That's why her blood was on his hands when he finally, after the crash occurred, pushed his seat all the way back um, in order to give him more room to kick out the window, which didn't work. So they bring Steve back in for questioning and he's at first denies having anything to do with her death. But then he changes his story. Uh, once they have all this evidence that they should tell him, he says, Deborah and I got into an argument that night about remodeling the cabin and changing some things about the cabin. I didn't want to do those things. She got mad. A fight broke out. We were in the car. And so I just reacted violently and I I pushed her and her head slammed into the corner of the, of the door. And so they arrest him and they question him again. And he, he kind of adds more to the story. He says that while they are in the car, that he specifically hit her head specifically, I guess purposefully, against the knob of the mirror. It wasn't like an accidental, like, oh, I just did it out of anger. He deliberately grabbed her and like, you know, smashed her head into it. And then he realized, oh my God, like what did I just do? And Deborah had kind of, kind of fallen out of the car, according to him. And he was like begging her to get back in the car. And he said he got her back in the car and he was on the way to the hospital when the crash occurred. Now, again, earlier I said he said he was going 65 miles per hour, but they would do a, a car accident reenactment with a whole bunch of people, a bunch of professionals, right? A bunch of smart people. And I am always amazed at the things that people can do with their brains. I just am. But they determined, they looked at the skid marks on the side of the road. They looked at the damage from both vehicles and they were actually able to determine how fast the vehicle was going that struck the other vehicle. So again, Steven said 65 miles per hour, but they said based on their findings that there was no way he was going any faster than 39 to 42 miles per hour. He was going way slower than he said. And he probably was going slower so that he wouldn't injure himself. And he even said he saw the taillights of that vehicle while he was driving. He noticed the vehicle. So how did he crash into it? Like, how did he not swerve? Because there was no indications he swerved or got out of the way. Nothing. He deliberately slammed into the back of that car. So he was charged with the murder, but the prosecutors were having, it wasn't easy to prove that this was like a planned, intentional, premeditated, you know, murder. So they can basically only charge him with second degree intentional homicide, um, indicating that this happened in a crime of passion situation where he it was not his intent to kill her, but he knowingly killed her like, but it was not his pre-planned thing that this just sort of happened in the spur of the moment. So because of that, he only was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. He was paroled after 11 years and he is now out there roaming the world, uh, free as a bird. And in my opinion, Deborah Hollerman, she did not get the justice she rightfully deserved. Uh, it, it seemed to me that she was deliberately murdered because he got caught uh, bringing his side woman who, by the way, he is now with still to this day, from what I understand, he is with that side woman now on a permanent basis. Watch out, lady, don't don't piss him off. Deborah only got 17 years of justice and she doesn't have the rest of her life to live. Stephen, however, does. He gets to walk the streets. He gets to marry people. He gets to watch his kids continue to grow up. He gets to watch her kids grow up. That's even worse. And he lives in the same town still that her family lives in. And so they have to like maybe see him from time to time. Make it make sense. <laughs> I guess in a sense, Deborah got some justice. I just wish that Deborah Hollerman got more justice. But that is it for this video. True crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry dongs and my battery thing is flashing. Son of a bitch. 
I am not good at timing these things out. Anyway, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Follow me over on TikTok and all the other places. I don't want to switch out the battery, guys, so I'm gonna have to go. So I just did a fast forward version of my normal uh, awkward uh, outro things. I just, so if you slow it down a lot, you'll hear exactly what I said. It's filthy, it's gross, and I apologize. Once It's also a demonic message. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Who are you, me? Hi. Okay, anyway, flashing, gotta go. So, but, uh, fudge, gotta go. Toodaloo, motherfucker!